Hi, everyone. Um, I'm super excited to be talking to all of you today, and I'm especially excited for you to be able to both meet and hear from the three of the four art of the five artists who are part of the ICAR AR app, which is just an extraordinary project. And I'm gonna let them obviously speak about their work in their own words, um, with the exception of Keith and Chandra, who, who are not unfortunately able to be with us today. But before we get to the sort of most exciting part, I wanna give you a little background and, and on the ways in which AR can and has been used for site interventions and some might say activism, um, and give you a sense of sort of how we got here and then foreground the project because I really see the ICAR project as the as a real cum culmination and um, sort of um, epitome of what's possible. So let's dive in. Um, this is about augmenting difficult realities. This is not AR used as you know filters or um, for Pokemon Go or anything like that. This is really using AR as a tool for subversion and to increase access and to prompt really thought, thoughtful discourse around um, subjects of, of urgency and importance to various artists. So um, just so you know how we got here, I, um, I should introduce myself. Yes, I am Nancy Baker Cahill. I am a new media artist. I also have my own AR platform called Fourth Wall App. I developed this app actually in 2018 as a means of, of doing a few things. I'd been working in virtual reality and I was frustrated with the barriers to entry and the problems with access. So I, I really wanted to kind of challenge what public art not only could be, but what would it mean in the hands of, um, of, of viewers? How, what would it mean to kind of participate collaboratively in a conversation around art, creating context and content outside of institutions of permission? traditional galleries, museums, uh, speaking of bar barriers of, in, of entry to entry. Um, so I developed this app and at first I just featured my own VR drawings that people could put anywhere in the world and in any context of their choosing, which they did, which was very exciting. And then it evolved into something that it's that that has to do with what we're talking about today, which is we um, in which and I'm going to get to that in a moment. So um, I, one of the things I did was I, of course, shared my app with everybody I knew at first, and one of the people that used it was a very close friend of mine, an artist and activist named Tanya Aganiga, who does a lot of work at the border. We live in Southern California, and this is obviously um, a really, a, a really contentious site. And she went down one day and put one of my VR drawings in the United States and pulled it through the border wall into Mexico. And I just want to show you what that looks like. And this was kind of a game changing moment for me as someone with this platform, because, you know, I, I had originally conceived of it as a, as a means of being creatively inclusive. And this was a real light bulb moment because I realized, oh, wow, we could actually use augmented reality for resistance. We could use it in these very targeted sites to have conversations about, about borders, about borderlessness and about the importance of of breaking down borders and using the technology in this way. So actually it was Tanya, Tanya was actually the very first artist that I invited to collaborate on the app. Uh, I went back to my team and they said, you know, we could, we could use geolocation um, and you could then, you know, situate, locate these AR artworks anywhere you wanted, anywhere in the world. And so that was the very first thing we did at the border at Playa, Playa de Tijuana uh, with Tanya's piece called Impotence Incarnate, because this is such a fraught site and such a site of, of so much pain, not just for her, but for, for everyone. Um, and that was really that was really exciting and basically launched the entire coordinates ecosystem. So in the meantime, we've had a number of AR art exhibitions really all over the world. And you're looking at this beautiful sailboat created by a local artist here, Nova Jang, uh, which addresses climate change over the, over the park in LA. Uh, I also wanted to say, I hope I, I, I always, I tend to sort of blow through this, but if anyone is unclear as to what augmented reality is, it's a digital layer um, that acts as a, a kind of additional interface in through your screen and your, it's obviously invisible to the naked eye, 
but with your phone as a, as a visual prosthesis, you can experience these artworks, which really contributes to a lot of its subversive potential, as you'll see. So, you know, this just opened the floodgates and I ended up collaborating with, I have since collaborated with dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of artists who really felt that they wanted to, and they chose specific sites all over the United States and really the globe to talk about things like, you know, uh, transgender visibility, undocumented um, immigration and, and, and deportation and the injustices they're in, um, all kinds of, all kinds of, um, all kinds of things, particularly here in LA. Um, we had an exhibition called Defining Line where artists dealt with everything from colonization, gentrification, the erasure of indigenous peoples. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity to engage, um, you know, histories and to really tell these untold stories on site, on location. And one thing I just want to say briefly is that, you know, I, I talk a lot about site specificity and I was, I was counseled by a lawyer actually not to talk about site activation and instead to talk about idea activation because there is and will be a lot of claims to, for space that will be policed and censored. And this way, when you talk about it as idea activation versus site activation, that space, that shared cultural thought space doesn't belong to anyone, it belongs to all of us. Um, I also wanted to speak briefly to the powerful immersion, uh, immersive potential of sound. We don't just engage the visual senses, but we can also engage oral senses, which is our oldest sense. And um, I did a piece on surveillance, very, very simple. And it's just, a, it's just a simple graphite drawing, a kind of Oculus in the sky. It's, I placed it all over the world because of course surveillance is everywhere. But you can hear with sound, wait, let me just make sure that I'm actually sharing sound. Um, you can hear just how powerful the simplest combination of sound and image can be. And you're gonna see that more of that in a moment. Um, <laughs> That of course was intended, but is not nearly as um, as effective as what you're going to see from these artists. It's also, you know, I this is I assume a safe space, but it has also allowed me to do some subversive work um, above Trump rallies, actually. So, in fact, this piece with Putin was during the Trump rally where he sort of said, "What's wrong with white nationalism?" Um, and so, having this playing the entire time was was very satisfying. The Democrats. Um, I also, what you're gonna to see today also involves more complex uh, iterations of, of AR. And I was invited to participate in Desert X, which is uh, a biennial here in the desert and chose to make some pieces about climate change. But as you can see, the beauty of AR is also our ability to scale. We can take up space and in the process do absolutely no harm to the environment. You know, this is not disruptive. We're not digging up soil. We're not, you know, impinging on anything other than just bodies on site and of course whatever it took to get there in terms of like cars public transportation etc um just to speak again to the opportunity uh, there's a lot of conversation right now about monuments and ar is a wonderful way to address monuments uh without having to again put something physically in space but to have really rich conversations around what those monuments are who they're for and whom they serve or don't. This is a beautiful piece outside of Orleans Parish Prison. This is when this is one of the moments when I knew we were in alignment with ICAR when um, David was talking to us about the different sort of pillars that they wanted to approach in this project. You know, we've done a lot of work already with prison and the prison industrial complex. And this is a piece in New Orleans that connects the prison industrial complex to the fast food industry and exhaustive research on the part of this incredible artist, Nick Aziz. Um, one of our artists, one of our ICAR artists, did a number of, of interventions all over the Lower Ninth Ward in, in, in New Orleans, and this was a very explicit um, opportunity for them to actually claim space, to reclaim this space. This is a neighborhood that's been gentrified after being des devastated by Hurricane Katrina, and this was a very, very important site to the community because it was a church led by women, um, and that was vilified, of course, by all most white churches, but was a, was a cornerstone and centerpiece of, of the community and a source of real um, 
you know, spiritual, it was a spiritually centered place that, and it gave tremendous help to everybody in the, in the uh, neighborhood, which is now gone. And, and it was important to Keith and Chandra that we mark the site and we say, this was here, this mattered, and this is our legacy. Um, I was invited to do a piece called Liberty Bell, which was an interrogation of what liberty or freedom really means. And just again, to sort of reiterate, um, the, the power of sound with married to image and our ability to do this all over. So this was a piece that appeared in a number of historically or culturally significant uh, locations in the United States. It was a rather dark take on, on the idea of liberty. Um, and this also, I wanna just say briefly, involved tremendous community engagement. And that is something that's really crucial to all of these projects. I know that comes up a lot. You know, is this just someone coming in and, and sort of deciding that this is a place and, and plopping something down? No, it involved lots of conversation, lots of engagement with the various communities that would be impacted by these artworks and conversations and programming around that. Back to this idea of AR monuments. Uh, I was so fortunate to collaborate with uh, an artist and a spoken word poet and curator in Louisville, Kentucky over the summer, two summers ago now. Um, and this was a monument that Brianna Harlan made with permission of Bri Brianna Taylor's family to Brianna Taylor. And again, you know, this is, this is, if you go to Louisville, this is right in front of Metro Hall. And you can <laughs> There's a whole, there's a whole poem um, actually by Hannah Drake, which if you go to the fourth wall app or dot org website, you can, you can listen to in its entirety. I was also really fortunate to collaborate with 80 artists led by Castles and Rafa Esparza, who um, created basically messages of solidarity and hope for immigrants and um, victims of human rights violations in these immigrant detention centers all over the United States. And it turns out there are about 500 and 500 plus of such, of such um, institutions. And so they had this one moment where they did all this live sky writing, but they wanted these messages to live on in perpetuity. And we're actually continuing this project in Texas in a few months, but this is just an example of how AR can be used, I think incredibly powerfully, if simply to, to empower and to, and to share solidarity. And most recently in Los Angeles, uh, I was a part of a residency where we all created speculative monuments. What would a future monument look like? In other words, not so much looking back, but looking forward. And the various artists dealt with um, Black Lives Matter and replacing, you know, an abolition, basically replacing the police, the LAPD, which is that Audrey Chan's piece there, um, affordable housing, creating new uh, models for housing and, and equity in, in, um, in, that, in the housing market here in Los Angeles, and then a reclamation of space for indigenous communities as well. And this is actually a, a, a monument that was taken down here in Los Angeles was very exciting. And then mine here is a motherboard, which is about mycelium and, and uh, other stuff. So I'm gonna end with this image uh, currently over the Pacific. This is a piece about climate change that I created. And um, basically I'm just showing you so that you can see how dramatic this is. And immersive, I would say, um, which leads us to this incredible project. So this has been months and months in the making. Uh, incredible, tireless work on all on everyone's um, uh, on on behalf of everyone. Basically, ICAR, my team, certainly the artists themselves, and involved and required quite a bit of patience. And I'm so excited to introduce you to each of these artists who will speak to their own work. Um, in this app. So um, again, the three sort of areas of focus for ICAR, as you well know, were the prison industrial complex, uh, big agriculture, and oil and gas. And of course, a lot of the things that are related to those and, and all of the externalities of those, those, um, those industries. So we will start with Keith and Chandra, who can not be here, but you saw their work in New Orleans over the, in the Lower Ninth Ward. They have done incredible work documenting um, all kinds of uh, egregious infractions and, and really just documenting the reality of uh, prison life, particularly in the Deep South, Angola in particular. And if you're interested in their work, you should go to their website. They are extraordinary artists. 
And part of what was appealing about these, they've done, so, they've done so much work that it was hard to choose, but part of what was appealing about these images is that they are recent images. They look historic, but they are recent. And so we felt there was a real resonance here to, to talk about how little has changed and that the, the conditions of slavery remain. And in fact, that slavery itself is, is it persists and is legal in, in this context. So this is in front of the Department of Justice and it is a two-sided piece that actually rotates slowly. And um, my hope anyway, and I, I, I'm sure this hope is shared by ICAR is that it will prompt research and curiosity around um, these, the, you know, the, the systemic inequities that, that are um, baked in and profit margins that are baked into to the prison industry. Um, and next, I want to actually invite Stacy Lynn Waddell to present to kind of foreground her piece. And she's going to share screen. Let me see. Yep. Stacy, you should be able to, um, to share your screen. And I wonder if you could just introduce yourself. And this goes for Emma and Alfredo too. Just introduce yourself first and say a few words about you know, where you're coming from in your practice and then and then talk about your piece. And I'm so excited to, to share it um, when you're done. So just give me the same signal when you're done, okay? All right, let me, I'll stop sharing mine. I think you're muted though, Stacey. There we go. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So my name is Stacey Lynn Waddell. I'm an artist that is located in North Carolina. I'm um, from North Carolina and um, just, uh, I don't know what else, what more to say other than I'm really excited to be a part of this project. Thank you, Nancy, for the invitation. And thank you, ICAR, um, for um, sponsoring this. It's been a really interesting, um, project to be a part of because it's so different from what I typically do. And yet I have found so many incredible intersections between the sort of digital nature of, of AR and my analog practice. I am largely, get that started. Um, my work uh, could generally be thought of as um, me using history as a metaphor for history. Uh, I like to play with, um, take history and sort of reclaim spaces and objects and places to uh, reinterpret. Um, as we know that narrative, many of the narratives that we uh, were taught were much was left out. And so I see that as an opportunity um, to come in and to rewrite um, and to represent. Um, I find, as I said, really interesting intersections between augmented reality and my analog practice. Although I'm not using digital technology in any way, um, my decorative in interventions where I'm embellishing surfaces or using systems of mark making um, are really akin to what I think are these gen computer generated bits of information that AR superimposes in the real world. Here, you'll see a piece entitled uh, Landscape with Rainbow after a celestial explosion for Robert Duncanson, uh, dated 1859 and 2021. I've taken uh, Duncanson's Landscape with Rainbow. For those of you, you may not know or remember that this was one of the inaugural gifts uh, when Biden and Harris were, um, during their, the inauguration, this painting was presented to them as one of the inaugural gifts. I've taken a cross section as I tend to do of Duncanson's work, Duncanson being probably the first most important uh, black artist uh, who was sponsored, had a chance to go to Europe, et cetera, et cetera. So this idea of having someone have an opportunity um, that opens up a whole host of possibility at a time when you wouldn't see a black practitioner of the high art, much less um, having the freedom to roam and to inhabit spaces and then reinterpret them as important paintings. I've taken this and taken this idea of the rainbow in his painting and turned it into a celestial or uh, heavenly 
or atmospheric explosion. And it's gold leaf and metal leaf and burnt paper. Another 19th century landscape I like to play with the 19th century Hudson River school landscape paintings because I find them really interesting and I find them as places of reclamation where I can go in as the artist and reclaim bits of the narrative to tell more a more true story. This is a, a piece entitled a Cross Current in Oxbow Scene from Mount Holyoke, Northampton, Massachusetts after a thunderstorm. And for those of you that are up on your 19th century landscape painting, um, that is taken directly from Thomas Cole, who we consider sort of the father of landscape painting. And yet I am taking that painting and reinterpreting it by taking the sculptural work of Thaddeus Mosley, uh, African-American, sculptor living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He's in his 90s and he sculpts these beautiful uh, uh, pieces from wood that he goes from felled trees that people give him that he goes and finds, but these sort of crafted, sculpted, carved wooden pieces are beautiful. They seem otherworldly, but they come directly from the landscape and uh, places now that we consider um, important, but these, this, this sort of combining someone like Mosley, a contemporary artist's work in this space, a, a black man in the space of Thomas Cole's um, historic importance shows a kind of similarity in terms of two men from two very different time periods being concerned about the natural landscape, both of them naturalist in their own, uh, in their own way. Another Thomas Cole, Thaddeus Mosley um, connection where again, burned paper, gold leaf. I'm asking the viewer to kind of get involved in sort of process to get them interested in this scene and this place and maybe ask questions about it. Do these spaces still exist? What is it that uh, is important about the natural landscape? What is it important about the inhabitants of this space and why they're important for us, not just these spaces, but the earth. Why is it important for us to care, to take care of it? The other um, um, thing that, that I like to engage in is what I call the kind of low relief sculptural work. And all of it is indebted to my interest in, again, surface embellishment and drawing. This is what I call one of my damaged emergency blankets. I first started thinking about these uh, sculptural forms some years ago as I started seeing like images on the cover of uh, the front page of the New York Times. Anytime there's a refugee crisis, you see this sort of like image where um, someone's wearing one of these uh, mylar blankets. You'll see them at um, uh, races where people are running marathons. They give quick, these thin, uh, shiny, reflective blankets give sort of emergency sources of heat and protection. What I've done is I've taken paper and I've gilded it and I have done other things to it. I've distressed it to kind of transform something very mundane into something that is attractive, but also calls into question materiality and sculpture and all of those other kinds of things. And these blankets have become sort of important for me as I sort of make a switch from two-dimensional work to three-dimensional work, but also this idea of something that blankets, that covers, that hovers, that has kind of a low um, uh, sculptural, it hovers just slightly off the wall. You can transform it into various shapes. Um, it becomes a kind of, symbol for me of, of the many possibilities in my practice. And so my um, piece, which Nancy will show you an image of when I'm done talking, called What Octavia E. Butler Saw When She Landed at the Site, is really a tribute to, at once, Octavia Butler, who is an important uh, science fiction writer, she's no longer with us, but she still is, so I'm not saying was, an important science fiction writer, MacArthur winner, 
um, someone who there's a site, a landing site at Mars, on Mars, named after Octavia Butler. She was prophetic. Her work uh, basically foretells the period that we're in and headed toward should we uh, not uh, do what needs to be done in terms of uh, climate change, in terms of global warming. This is the final image. This is just me in my studio recently as I was preparing for um, a project opening in New York and I'm actually holding um, materials from a really expansive blanket project, another emergency blanket that will be on view in uh, Rome, Italy next fall. But you'll see, you see me in my studio with these other sort of reflective, you know, there's some canvases at work, there's some other things that are happening. Um, but this idea of taking something that is attractive um, and drawing people to it and then holding them there because when we see something shiny and reflective, there's a kind of optical response that we have to it. And then hopefully while they're being held in that moment of attraction, they, I can then offer them some pathways through which to get at some other um, ways of thinking about what they're looking at. And that's what I hope what Octavia E. Butler saw when she landed at the site um, will do. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. That was awesome. And I'm so excited for people to see the big moment of what led to this gorgeous piece, which is, as you can see, right over the reflecting pool so that you have the Lincoln Memorial behind you. Nancy, you have to share your screen. Oh, shoot. I'm, I'm the only person enjoying this right now. Hold on. Sorry. Wait a second. So being technically adept, hold on one second. I have to get back to the... Am I still, there we go. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that, everyone. I'm working with two different, um, I'm working with two different monitors. So sometimes there's confusion. Okay, excuse me, sorry about that. And okay. Here we go. <laughs> Stacy, I wonder if you wanted to just also add, you know, what these numbers mean and what the sort of varying topography of the blanket signifies? Sure, um, the, the countdown. I mean, I, I think just seeing numbers or dates count up or down just points to the imminence, right? The, the, the seriousness of the situation, the fact that time is upon us. But so what you're seeing is um, a world map and there's sort of a, a, a count count up, I guess, or count down, however you'd like to interpret it, of the impacts of, of climate change, of global warming, and how that clock, that time clock is getting near. I mean, I think the, the latest date is, does it go to 2020, correct? So, yeah, it, yeah. so it's, it, it's counted down to present day. Like, we're not looking at I talked a lot about history, right? The me using history as a metaphor for history. We can't sort of just think about what happened decades ago. Like we're in it now. Like it's it's we're we're past time to do something about it. So this world map and the countdown is really the um, the changing, the quickly changing world that we're living in. The circumstances that are are beyond dire. So yeah. So it's this beautiful combination of like gorgeous and and sort of sobering all at once. 
Um, I want to make sure that we have time for Emma and Alfredo to talk about their work. So Emma, um, I would love Emma's piece actually occurs in two locations. I'm going to let her really talk about where this piece comes from, and then it's it's quite powerful uh, to listen to too. So we have an excerpt from it that I'd love to play whenever you're whenever you're done, Emma, or ready, I should say. Great, thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Stacy. That was amazing to see everything to start my morning out with that art. My name is Emma Robbins and I am on Tongva land or in Los Angeles currently. I go back and forth between here and the Navajo Nation, which is where I'm from and where this piece is really, I guess, rooted from and in these two different locations. I am an artist, I'm an activist, a community organizer, and I'm also the executive director of the Navajo Water Project. Um, we're a human rights org that works back home on the reservation in a couple different locations. And then I'm also the founder of the Chapter House, which is a um, community art space for indigenous peoples. So these pieces are actually combining all of those things. Um, I make a lot of artwork that I consider very analog and very manual. So this piece was really awesome to work with Nancy and her team um, because everything that I do is very material heavy. So drawing things that are both traditional and sort of pan Indian, um, taking things that are humorous like tourist postcards. And then also the traditional would be different plants that are native to my own res and to my own culture. So this piece is about several things. I mentioned my background and you know a lot of what I work in is water rights, our educational pieces about missing and murdered indigenous women and relatives. And I guess rather than using the different elements and materials, um, when I was making this, what I really thought about was incorporating an audio piece because obviously people will be standing in front of this and experiencing it but in a much different way, rather than seeing the postcards or the plants or the jingles or the feathers or the hair. Um, working with my community, I collaborate with them very closely as well in my art, including my family. And so this was, you know, basically a collaboration with my dad, Tony and I, um, and the audio includes Deneh Bizad or our language and the Navajo language. And so over the years, I've become really interested in the mark of the X because a lot about what I, a lot of what I talk about in every single facet of my work are treaties and broken treaties and issues on native nations, but also solutions, right? And one of the solutions is that we actually uphold the treaties. And I say we as pushing our governments, whether those are federal, state, county, tribal, um, and also as native people standing up and saying, we need to honor these. We're a sovereign nation and it's important that we take these documents very seriously. So the X mark um, represents what native peoples or leaders signed their names with when they signed these hundreds of documents with the federal government since the quote unquote founding of the United States um, up until you know the mid 1900s. And so Next to them, it would say their names in English and because they couldn't sign it and read the treaties and oftentimes didn't fully understand it because it wasn't in our cultures, um, you know, the ideas of land ownership and boundaries. And I, I do wanna say as a Navajo, I'm speaking really just for my own reservation and for my own culture, because obviously we are hundreds, if not thousands of tribes in the Americas, in the United States. Um, so people's names were written out in English for them and explained to them in a language that was not theirs. And then a simple X mark was made to really change their history. So Nancy mentioned that we're going to show an excerpt and then I will just talk a little bit about the audio afterwards and then pass it along. <laughs> I am Dene, and I am from the Navajo Reservation. My reservation is one of 326 in the United States alone. Between 1778 and 1871, the United States government signed hundreds of treaties with indigenous peoples, and every single one has been broken. 
They were written in English and signed by government representatives and tribal leaders who placed a simple X mark next to their names, as they did not know how to sign their names in a language that was not ours. The federal government has cited these important legal agreements when convenient for them, but have repeatedly broken their promises when it comes to our rights. These treaties state that corporations and profit-making peoples are not allowed to enter our reservations, but they do over and over again. Many companies have come onto our lands to mine, frack, and build oil pipelines, leaving our earth devastated, our water undrinkable, and our air polluted. These companies bring man camps near or on our lands, making our women and girls vulnerable to assault, violence, and murder. I have witnessed this on my own reservation and I have seen the extreme and deadly effects that uranium extraction has on community members and their health today. This happens on many reservations and is directly attributed to broken treaties. The United States government paves the way for wealthy corporations to come onto our land and exploit our resources and our people. They pass laws and remove legal requirements for big companies like environmental impact studies that would help stop the destruction despite having signed legal contracts with us saying that they would help protect our lands. The same government who promised to stop these evil things from happening to us turns a blind eye, forgets the promises they made, and stomps all over our treaties, placing profit over people. We suffer because of greed and because money means more than people and our earth. We as native people are strong and resilient and we fight this greed daily to ensure that the promises made are upheld so that we can protect our people, our culture, and our earth. And whether you are native or not, it is important that we all hold the federal government accountable and make sure that they are doing the bare minimum, staying out of the pockets of big companies and honoring the treaties because the X's that we made so many years ago are still important today. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so I mentioned working with my dad, you know, you could hear there at the beginning and at the end, what my dad is reading or interpreting, because again, you know, many of these words that were put in treaties didn't exist in our own language. And so he's interpreting the treaty. Um, it was a really emotional process to work with my dad because I know this treaty well, it's the treaty of 1868, it's the government outlining things like your children must go to school and they must learn English. And that means that people were taken from their families to, you know, um, fulfill the idea that the federal government had, which is uh, kill the Indian, save the man. Um, and my dad was someone who was taken from his family when he was very young and put in a boarding school. And it's not that I want to be exploitative or own his story. It's just something that he and I are working through together. And so reading this treaty and reading lines like that and really thinking about what it was in 1868 to have a white officer explaining this to my people was really difficult and emotional for both my dad and me because I think it's just something that we Navajos reference like you promise infrastructure and this is why 30% of Navajos don't have running water and that's what I work with every day you know and so I think it was really important to me in sort of this full circle and I'm really appreciative to be able to do this piece because I've never worked with audio and again this was like replacing materials that I use um so yeah I'm really excited for y'all to see it and I think it's just something that was a full circle for me and it's only sparked new ideas and I know um we'll just take a few seconds here to talk about the fact that it is in Phoenix or the state capital of so-called Arizona um, at the Code Talkers Memorial, and I'm sure everyone knows who the Code Talkers are, but if not, they were a group of Diné men um, who used our traditional language to um, help fight World War II. And so it was kind of like, again, the federal government is using things 
from our culture and from our people um, when it's convenient for them. And I just strongly believe in all of the work that I do that we do need to hold the federal government accountable. Oftentimes people say, oh, well now there's a Democrat in office and now you know administration has changed. Oftentimes it doesn't matter to us. Um, it doesn't matter which party is in office because we're overlooked. And I think the cool thing about living in 2021 is we have social media and the internet and uh, projects like this where we can speak up and we can speak up widely to hold um, these people accountable. So thank you. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Um, wow. Um, okay. Without further ado, I will, and in the interest of time, no, move yeah, no. to Alfredo. Alfredo, do you want to talk? Do you want to introduce this piece and just tell us a little bit about yourself first, and then, and then we'll play it. I, I believe this is an excerpt, but it might go all the way to the end. So, take it away. Uh, peace, everyone. Uh, honored to be here, um, coming to you from Lenape Land, aka New York, aka Staten Island. Um, so beautiful to see uh, the other works. Um, very happy to be a part of that collection. Um, my piece is called Las Manos de Mis Padres, or um, roughly translated to English as The Hands of My Elders. Uh, and it's a work essentially honoring the lives of field workers, agricultural workers. Um, I'm really interested in the way that um, we feed ourselves in this in this society and the way that colonialism and white supremacy has turned that system into something that is um, unattainable and toxic for a lot of people, toxic both in the literal sense and in you know other senses of labor and practices and the way that people are treated. Um, so I essentially just wanted to make a poem uh, for the people and thinking a lot about um, a visual poem, you know, uh, thinking a lot about how, um, you know, these, these things that we have as staples to our food, you know, in our nutrition now, um, you know, come from uh, indigenous sources. And specifically, I wanted to honor uh, what's called uh, traditionally the three sisters, which is corn, squash, and beans, um, three of the native crops here. Um, in this side of the continent, I mean, really across the continent, but very specifically in the north, um, where people would actually um, plant these together, creating a um, symbiotic relationship between the three plants, uh, and then, of course, with people, um, and just the way that um, indigenous peoples across this continent really understood the connection to the herbs and the plants, not as something to be consumed, but as sisters and brothers that were to be honored and reciprocated with. So that's pretty much what the work is about. Um, so you can play it now. And uh, so there's a poem in it, it's in Spanish. So if you don't speak Spanish, I'm sorry. There's some uh, little tiny letters at the bottom that say what it is, so yeah. My Sagrado, tú que naciste de estas tierras, tú que nos alimentaste por generaciones, ¿Cómo es que tus grandes tallos son ahora las barras que nos mantienen presos? Tres hermanas divinas, no nos dejen olvidarlas. Regálenos una vez más el secreto de sus raíces entrelazadas. semillas por donde van, cuántas de ellas han germinado, cuánta sangre han derramado las espinas de frutos que nunca probarán, ustedes que van sembrando semillas de esperanza, esperanza de que el fruto de su vientre pueda ver el sol más resplandeciente, sueños de mejores vidas, sus flores son nuestras vidas, sus frutos son nuestro progreso. Gracias por sus manos callosas, que sangran del alba al ocaso, 
para alimentarnos a todos. Es noble. Okay, um, I, that was I. That's where our um, our recording cut off. But I want to just say uh, that actually, when you're on site, it, I think because I've I I put this on a white background, you lose a little bit of the um, of the subtitles, but they are there. They're very visible, and the poetry in English and Spanish is so extraordinarily beautiful. And um, I personally, let me put myself back on video. Um, I want to thank everybody so much, and I'm so grateful for these brilliant artists, for all of their hard work, for this entire project, for the support of ICAR, for the vision that we all shared to hold these um, corporations and government really accountable and to use art to do so and to expand these conversations and deepen and enrich them and make them accessible for a broad audience. Um, I am so blown away by every single one of those pieces, I have to say. Um, so I, I think we have a little time for questions. If, if um, anyone wants to address the artist directly, they can speak, the, as you can see, so beautifully to their own work. And uh, so I will stop talking and, and open that up. I have a question for this. Is, everybody knows me. My name's David. I'm, I've been working on this for a long time. But Emma, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the kind of the reasons we placed this. You placed this at the, you know, where you did in D.C. at the American History, you know, the Museum of American History. There is a, a museum of, I think it's somehow called the Museum of the American Indian. Um, but you know, we decided you decided not to place it there. What what was kind of the thinking behind that? David, good question. Um, and something that was constantly evolving throughout this process. So originally, we had talked about placing it in front of the Department of the Interior. Um, and that's because the Department of the Interior, which we all know oversees the lands in the United States and you know agriculture and all these other things, they also oversee the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is also the agency that issues things like Certificate of Indian Blood and things that are directly related to our culture um, and the treaties. And so it was there and, you know, we kind of decided like, oh, there's not a lot of foot traffic there. And as someone who works in the water world, um, I do work with a lot of these different agencies in D.C. And I'm like, all right, yeah, that's true. And then so we talked about moving it to the Smithsonian um, Museum of the American Indian. And finally, we settled on doing it in front of the American History Museum because one, there's a lot more foot traffic, which is something that is really important to have that visibility. Um, two, because this is American history and it's not something that's spoken about often. Whenever I talk about treaties, the majority of the people will say like, you know, Americans or from other countries, oh, I didn't know that that was a thing, or I didn't even know that Native still existed in this area. So it's something that is really important to braid into American history and put it, you know, forward for people, not only to think like, why don't you know about this, but rather to push them to do things like Googling it. I always say, don't be frugal with your Google, um, looking it up. And then also, you know, we had talked about ICAR and Nancy and I, about then asking people to go on to the Museum of the American Indian and viewing those because these are histories that are listed there often or presented often and in fact they have this really beautiful exhibition about treaties so you know it's kind of like encouraging people to dip their toe into the water and then go on over to that other museum so one day when uh, people start flocking more into the Department of the Interior lesser of the cool federal building. Sorry for anyone who works um, there on this call. You know, yeah, I'd love to do something there and something that is definitely rooted in treaties as well. I also just wanted to ask, you know, for Alfredo, um, you know, we had kind of talked through, um, you know, kind of some of the messaging on this. And I know it, you, you come from a tradition of, 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 you know, family members or community members who um, have been working in 
in labor for many generations. I wanted to just have you maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you come to this issue and also, you know, why you felt it was important to focus on on the food and on the grains and on and on the workers as opposed to, um, you know, kind of a more, you know, a more direct connection between corporate power and and how people are treated treated because I think that that's that's how I come at this issue but I think what the way you're coming at it is incredibly powerful in the way I've heard you speak about it so I was just wondering if you would elaborate on that a little bit. Peace, yeah, David. I, I think um, I mean I think it's all interconnected, of course. Um, uh, you know that there is no separation of the oppression of you know black and brown people in this content in, in this continent uh, and corporate abuse and you know um, the way that we are you know uh, the way that, that our food system works you know it's all intertwined but for me like the most important part is the people um, you know I, um, I I know so many people who have those stories you know that like crossed the border and like got a job at some strawberry farm and broke their back for years and then with that money, they were able to like build a house back home or give their kids some college education, you know, and um, I just think it's really important to consider like, you know, who, I mean, like, you know, in my family, you know, we always like pray before we eat. And one of the things that we pray for is, we, you know, we, we asked for the hands that pick that food to be blessed, you know what I mean? Um, so, so, you know, kind of like considering like that whole chain of events that has to happen. Um, and for me, like one of the most important keys to the liberation of black and brown people, not just in this country, but in the entire world as it's dominated by these capitalistic forces, um, is to have uh, autonomy over our own food sources and medicine sources. And that has been really removed in this country, right? So most people just go to supermarkets and just shop for whatever, you know, and especially in America, like the quality of food is really devastatingly bad, right? So um, like chemical pesticides are everywhere. You know, I was talking to a friend about how uh, a non-organic apple in America might as well be considered toxic waste because it's just so full of poison. And it's really sad to think about that, you know? So I believe that, you know, these are things that, um, Native people across the world had developed a, a very um, symbiotic relationship to, like I was saying before, right, where like food or plants are not just considered resources, but they're considered relatives. And I think that's a really important uh, relationship that we have lost in Western society. So I wanted to basically honor those relatives and kind of, you know, uh, yeah, make a... a bring bring up the importance of, of those uh, those pieces coming together like both the hands and the people who are in direct conversation with these relatives and what these plant relatives give us back so that's why that's what you know it's kind of what's on my mind Hope that answers all the questions. It totally does. <laughs> I, I I also just was I wanted to ask Stacy if she would talk. Your you know your emergency blanket, your broken emergency blanket obviously moves in kind of a specific way, and that's not an accident. Can you talk a little bit about um, you know the data behind that movement? I mean, it obviously starts out relatively flat, and by the end is kind of taking over just the numbers counting. Um, that's based on that's based on some inputs, I believe. You're, you're muted again, sorry. I'm muted, of course, I'm muted, sorry. It's based on um, the, the data that points to the, the damage, you know, in, in the simplest terms, sort of like how, if, if you had a living sort of a chart or graph of, of showing the damage over time. So that's why the peaks become a lot more there's a lot more height and height in those peaks, or there's a lot more um, uh, on the topography shifts more dramatically. It's more acute as you're counting uh, forward. That's that's what happens. Uh, what what you're seeing in the simplest terms, what you're seeing, uh, which hopefully people 
with the addition of the counter, the numbers counting, they won't just think of this as this sort of sculptural, golden, reflective sort of thing. I mean, it's obviously it's hovering over the reflecting pool. It's meant for you to be in a space of reflection, of watching, of looking, of observing. But the numbers would ho hopefully will point to something that's imminent and important and that we should be paying attention to. And that's directly linked to data, right? This idea that numbers being linked to data, dates of some kind being linked to data, um, hopefully will make that connection to people. So. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry, y'all. I have to go catch a flight. So um, I want to say thank you so much to everyone. Um, I'm so proud of this project and um, so really awestruck by all of you. And I can't wait to unleash this on the world. I can't wait for people to, you know, um, to go out and experience it for themselves and start sharing and documenting and sharing with us and we can share and spread our collective words. So Thank you so much. I'm going to leave and and I guess we all are going to leave and <laughs> they've got more breakout sessions. So thank you so much for your time and have a wonderful uh, rest of the week and weekend.